Our second speaker is Rabbi Irving Greenberg, Greenberg, the former president of Jewish Life Network, whose mission is to create new institutions and initiatives to enrich the inner life of American Jewry. Amongst its initial projects were the Partnership for Excellence in Jewish Education, MACOR, a center for Jews in their 20s and 30s, and Birthright Israel, a worldwide program to enable diaspora Jewish youth to visit and study in Israel. He also served as chairman of the United States Holocaust Memorial Council. The council is charged with responsibility for the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum on the Mall in Washington, D.C. And the task of preserving the memory and drawing the lessons of the Holocaust on behalf of the United States government and the American people. An ordained Orthodox rabbi, a Harvard PhD, and a scholar, Rabbi Greenberg has been a seminal thinker in confronting the Holocaust as an historical transforming event and describing Israel as the beginning of a third era in Jewish history. In the book, Interpreters of Judaism in the Last 20th Century, Professor Stephen T. Katz wrote, quote, no Jewish thinker has had a greater impact on the American Jewish community in the last two decades than Rabbi Irving Greenberg, end quotes. Rabbi Greenberg has published numerous articles and monographs on Jewish thought and religion, including The Jewish Way, Living the Holidays, an analysis of the Sabbath and holidays, and Living in the Image of God, Jewish Teaching to Perfect the World. From 1974 through 1997, he served as the founding president of CLAL, the National Jewish Center for Learning and Leadership, a pioneering institution in the development of adult and leadership education in the Jewish community, and the leading organization in intra-Jewish dialogue and the work of Jewish unity. Before Klal was founded, he served as rabbi of the Riverdale Jewish Center, as associate professor of history at Yeshiva University, as founder, chairman, and professor in the Department of Jewish Studies at City College of New York, at the City University of New York, and as director of the President's Commission on the Holocaust and one of the founding figures of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. A pioneer in Holocaust education and theology and in the Jewish-Christian dialogue which sought to revise theology in light of the Shoah, his writings include such notable monographs on post-Shoah theology as Cloud of Smoke, Pillar of Fire, Judaism, Christianity, Modernity after the Holocaust, The Third Great Cycle of Jewish History, Voluntary Covenant, the Ethics of Jewish Power, Judaism and Christianity, Their Respective Roles in the Divine Strategy of Redemption, and Covenantal Pluralism. I can personally attest to Rabbi Greenberg's influence on the American Jewish community and its thinking about the Holocaust by stating that we would not be here tonight without him. In the early 80s, while lecturing on the Third Jewish Commonwealth, Rabbi Greenberg stated that a physician well-versed in Judaism would practice medicine different than a physician who was not. I did not understand at that time the meaning of this statement, and so I began to study Judaism and medicine, which ultimately led to this wonderful exhibit and lecture series. Tonight, he will speak about power for life or power for death, how and why science and religion can work together for life after the Holocaust. Please join me in thanking Rabbi Greenberg and in welcoming him to Holocaust Museum Houston. The state-sponsored systematic attempted murder of all Jews for the crime of being, and the actual mass killing of six million is in itself so horrifying and so evil that it is a natural human response. <clears throat> it's a natural human response to proclaim never again. If people experience the humanity and the reality of the victims, they intuitively commit to prevent a recurrence. Nevertheless, since 1945, there have been mass murders and attempted genocide in Cambodia, Bosnia, and Rwanda. 
This in itself is a reminder and a warning that mechanisms and specific policies must be developed if we are to successfully prevent a repetition. To develop effective protection mechanisms, we must first analyze what systemic failures occurred so that we can deal with them. Tonight, I am going to try to develop one particular approach by asking yet another question. Not what failures enabled the Nazis to pursue their evil plan to the bitter end, but rather what systemic factors made it possible to carry out the Holocaust? The painful answer is that some of the most fundamental mechanisms of modernity were essential to this genocide. That is why the Shoah could not have taken place except in modern civilization and within Western culture. And that is what we have to come to grips with. And I start with those factors. One, I look at technology. Technology, in particular the applied outgrowth of science, has been the pride of modern culture and justly so. Technology and its consequent productivity have become a source of affluence, of longer living. But here in the Shoah, they were mobilized for death. The Nazis organized the transportation of millions of victims to their death, especially the train transportation of Western Jews from Holland, France, Belgium, Italy, etc., across Europe in wartime to be murdered in the killing camps, which were located in Poland. The development of the technology of mass killing in itself was essential. The Nazis shifted from a policy of mistreatment, starvation, and local brutality to the use first of Einsatzgruppen squads, shooting squads, from June 22 to 1941 on, and then to mass murder by gas, which was cheaper, more efficient, and less directly visible. Furthermore, they improved large-scale gas chambers and crematoria, which were delivered by German corporations, which sought out these profitable contracts. A second central element of modern culture, bureaucracy. Bureaucracy, of course, is one of the great enablers, institutions of modern culture. Bureaucracy, bureaucratic protocols, are for efficient, dependable procedures with equal access and decisions on the merits. The professional ethic offers the ability to deal with millions and all the time. Raoul Hilberg's research in particular, although one can also see this in the work of Uwe Aden in Germany and the American historian Christopher Browning, calls attention and shows that bureaucratic bureaucracy was essential to the process of the Holocaust. For one, it was essential to the identification and to the registration of the Jews. Secondly, to Aryanization, the legal, quote unquote, legal sequestration of the Jews' property. And again, the transportation. It took enormous efforts to organize the shipment, ranging from travel schedules and train switching along the way to the charging and paying for deliveries of the people to their death. Thousands of bureaucrats <coughs> in government, in army, and in railway corporations and organizations were involved in this procedure. And of course, these procedures were followed as well in arranging for the construction and purpose of gas chambers and the purchase distribution of lethal gas, etc. Hilberg's point is that the bureaucratic mind was essential to successful prosecution of this destruction policy which lasted for years. In the past, say the Middle Ages, outbursts against Jews grew out of hatred and, as in the Crusades, sometimes out of religiously motivated hatred. But this very fact this method limited the reach toward victims 
And furthermore, as the hatred was released, the aggressors could not keep up the slaughter, certainly not indefinitely. By contrast, bureaucracy involves working in a nine to five job. The campaign presents as a process of legal definition of the victims, not as a violent assault. The workers follow procedural arrangements on a daily basis. They see their work not as an outburst of hatred, but as a job, as a professional opportunity. If they do better, in fact, they get ahead in their career. Overwhelmingly, the bureaucrats were able and willing to pursue these policies over a period of years and throughout Europe, wherever Jews were located. Speaking as a high-class administrator to the SS officers, who among other duties supervised the destruction of the Jews, Heinrich Himmler said, and I quote, we shall never be hard and heartless when it is not necessary. We will also adopt a decent attitude with regard to the human animals. Of course, he was referring to Russians, Czechs, and Slavs, not just to Jews. He further said, and I quote, that in carrying out the mass killing of the Jews, the SS had been unaffected and uncorrupted in its emotions. Himmler insisted, and I quote now, to have gone through this, and at the same time, apart from exceptions caused by human weakness, to have remained decent, that has made us hard, by which he meant hard, that is to say, able to do our duty without flinching. Since there were neither corrupt motives, such as enrichment, nor vile emotions, such as sadism or hatred involved, or so he claimed, as a bureaucrat, there was some truth to that, Himmler said, quote, we have suffered no harm to our inner self, our soul, our character in so doing. This is a chapter of glory in our history. It was only a matter of course of tact for us, thank God, never to speak of it, never to talk of it, close quote. A third modern factor is, of course, ideolog ideology. I mean, and specifically, ideological utopianism. Visions of perfecting and totally transforming the world have received a credibility in this culture, modernity, because of great breakthroughs. The vision has been so total, it has enabled people to commit great crimes, to murder people for the sake of perfecting the world. Totalitarian systems like Stalinism, Maoism, and National Socialism gave such elan such drive to the vision of societal transformation as to enable people to overcome their natural human hesitation to murder and to dispose of millions of people without holding back. Otto Ohlendorf, who was the head of one of the Einsatzgruppen, that is to say the killing squads, the squads killed, the squads killed a million and a half Jews between June 22nd, 1941 and December 1942, by which time they were mostly superseded by killing centers and gas chambers. In his final plea, Ollendorf made the following. I will say this for Ollendorf. He was one of the few heads of the Einsatzgruppen who publicly accepted responsibility, who acknowledged that he had committed the crime. The others tried to evade and deny their responsibility. But again, he did so because he was able to offer an ideological utopian vision to justify as he saw it his behavior. And I quote, National socialism is not the cause, but the effect of a spiritual crisis. Man lacked absolute and human uniform values in his life. Religious values and laws took an ever smaller space in his emotions, thinking, and acting. Society, organized into separate states, found in this development no uniform values, which might have been the constant objective of society or the state. Therefore, the endeavors to preserve the status quo within the state and the nation were replaced by the will to eliminate the status quo by means of war or revolution. My generation were longing for spiritual support. Members of this generation have become too realistic to believe that by fixing their eyes on beyond this world, that they would find the moral and social basis for their existence. 
This generation looked for ways and means to replace the changing rule of group interests by an order which was based on a conception of totality in relation to every single individual, irrespective of his social status. Since human beings were not bound together by common ideals, Bolshevism appeared as the idol, equipped not only with power and force, but even with martyrs." Close quote. Therefore, Ollendorf argues, the only alternative, the correct alternative, was National Socialism. And he goes on to say, quote, these defendants entered on their task convinced that they were backed by a genuine and justified moral force. They felt that their work was necessary, of course, to perfect the world, even if it opposed their own inner tendencies and interests. They had to decide not only on the survival of their nation, their families and themselves, but they saw in themselves the protective shield guarding other nations against one common enemy. They had to accept the methods and orders in this war. Faced by the tension between the two basic forces in history, their longing for the realization of ethical and moral ideas against the power of actual history, that is to say he means to say the status quo, with its overwhelming strength, that is why they acted. The fourth factor, characteristic of our time and our culture and its glory, is of course scientific and scientism. Scientific discipline includes training for effective neutrality in doing the work. People are trained, people are trained to separate or suspend moral judgment to achieve greater methodological accuracy and objectivity in method. The moral character and behavior of the researcher is irrelevant unless that leads to tampering with the execution of the experiment properly. This training paves the way for an instrumental ethic, which of course is an abuse of science, but it's an instrumental ethic that equates efficiency and dependability to a moral ethic and ignores the ethical object and impact of the activity. I'd refer you to the work of Peter Haas on the Nazi ethic, of Robert Lifton on the doctor's role in the Nazi program, including the euthanasia, as you heard about tonight, or making the selections at Auschwitz, who again were essentially guided and strengthened by their sense that the ethic was to act properly and to follow the group's goals. What made this worse, of course, was the Nazis' ability to invoke a eugenic and Darwinian science and scientific language to claim that they were acting to upgrade humanity by strengthening and multiplying the superior human beings and by eliminating genetically inferior beings, the, the handicapped, the mentally ill, and so on, and the genetically, morally, psychologically inferior Jews not to mention their repression and eventual reduction of the inferior Slavs. As Lifton and others have shown, the mass murderers were able, and the doctors were able to use the language of therapeutic medicine and of healing, arguing that's what they were doing by eliminating these people. And therefore they harnessed a legit and gave legitimacy to a selection process whereby humans were killed. And of course, turning the victims in another medical misuse into bacilli, into virulent pathogens to be eliminated by their behavior. Another factor, a fourth factor, is of course universalism. In the modern cultural ideal, rules and regulations are universal. This translates into equal access with equal rights in processes and with no exceptions, which of course makes possible much of the humane and rights practices of our own culture. But applied to killing, the result is a policy that all Jews must die, and there are to be no exceptions. In his speech to SS officers at Posen in October 4th, 1943, Himmler said, and I quote, 
I want to mention another very difficult matter before you in all frankness. I am speaking now of the evacuation of the Jews, the extirpation of the Jewish people. It is one of those things that's easy to say. He's quoting people said this to him. The Jewish people will be extirpated, says every party comrade. That's quite clear. It's in our program. Elimination of the Jews, extirpation, that's what we're doing. And then they all come back and say, these 80 million good Germans, every one of them has his decent Jew. Of course, it's quite clear that the others are pigs, but this one is a first-class Jew. That's, of course, the exception. Himmler's answer was that there would be no exceptions. Clearly to him, the universal execution of the Jews and of the final solution was a sign of moral superiority. With his throne dripping sarcasm and contempt, Hitler made clear he believed that the people asking for exceptions were weak. They agreed to the final solution, but were uncomfortable to face the nature of the mass killings. Quote, not one, meaning of those asking for the exception, not one has looked on, not one has lived through it, close quote. By contrast, the SS officers who enforced the extirpation order and carried it out, quote, most of you know what it means when a hundred bodies lie together, when 500 lie there, or if a thousand lie there. But Himmler insisted that while, quote, it made everyone shudder, yet everyone was clear in his mind that he would do it again if ordered to do so. This universal authority, the unchecked absolute claim of modernity, had another very deleterious effect. The unquestioned worship of this culture even blinded the victims to what was being done to them. Alexander Donat, in his memoir of life in the Warsaw Ghetto, described the torment of those who survived the initial wave of deportations to Treblinka. Why had they not anticipated the expulsions? Why had they not resisted in some organized way? After weighing various factors, Donat concluded as follows, I quote, the basic factor in the ghetto's lack of presentation, preparation for armed resistance was psychological. We did not at first believe the resettlement operation to be what in fact it was, a systematic slaughter of the entire Jewish population. For generations, East European Jews had looked to Berlin as the symbol of law, order, and modern culture. We could not now believe that the Third Reich was a government of gangsters embarked on a program of genocide to solve the Jewish problem in Europe. We fell victim to our faith in mankind, our belief that humanity now set limits to the degradation and persecution of one's fellow man. When Elie Wiesel and his father arrived in Auschwitz in the summer of 1944, one of the prisoners approached and pointed to a fire up ahead and angrily told them they would be gassed and burned. Shocked and disoriented, Wiesel reacted, again I'm quoting his description, I simply refused to believe my eyes and ears. I thought, they are mocking in order to scare us. It amuses them. We are living in the 20th century after all. Jews are not burned anymore. The civilized world would not allow it. Wiesel goes on to say, I asked him, my father, the Middle Ages are behind us, aren't they, father, far behind us? 75 yards were from the place of open burning pits where children were being burned alive to save the gas. Wiesel and his father could not believe this is possible because this is the 20th century. The Nazi breakthrough that enabled them to carry out the final solution, I would point to the policy of Gleichschaltung, of bringing together all these factors so critical to contemporary culture, to take over these forces and to harness with them all institutions and power centers in Germany to Nazi control. During the war, all these power centers were dedicated to a higher objective, to destroy the Jews. While there were various bureaucratic rivalries and conflicts, there were no fundamental checks 
and no balances to stop the process. Carrying out the Holocaust even was given priority over the war effort. Thus, Jewish transports bringing Jews to Auschwitz were given priority over trains to bring munitions or reinforcements to hard-pressed German armies in Russia. Yet, there was no resistance from generals, from courts, from legislators, from popular opinion to this priority. Making this worse, and in many, in many countries, especially in Eastern Europe, the bystanders were intimidated or indifferent to the killing. Often they were sympathetic and cooperative due to anti-Semitic feelings. In the work of Helen Fine, I refer particularly to her book on accounting for genocide, she shows the correlation of low survival rates of Jews to high rates of anti-Semitism and the presence of anti-Semitic political parties in the pre-war country. By contrast, for example, in Denmark, where there was little anti-Semitism and high integration of Danish Jews, the public and the government condemned the Nazis and refused to abandon the Danish Jews. In short, public opinion and moral consensus could check the Nazis, but in most countries, public attitudes countervailing the Nazis were weak. Finally, the military political weakness of the victims themselves was such that there was no serious physical or military counterforce they could mount that could stop or reduce the killing. In the work of H.J. Rummel, who has pointed to, I cite just one example of a multiple set of books, of the 10 leading mass murders of the 20th century, none was committed by a democracy. Democracy, of course, involves checks and balances, which break up power. So one cannot focus all technological, all bureaucracies, all moral forces needed to carry out such a genocide. In summary, modern civilization and culture has generated enormous concentrations of power both material and ideological. The ideology and the intention, of course, was power to be used for life, to improve living conditions, to extend longevity, to increase education and culture, and to expand human dignity and rights. But after the Holocaust, we now understand that all this power can be equally brought to bear for death, for the con total control of society, for concentration of the victims, for waging an all-out war and mass annihilation. It becomes essential, therefore, if we are to prevent the repetition, to establish controls and limits on the exercise of all forms of power. I would therefore argue that the single most efficacious limit on the exercise of power is to pluralize the sources, the channels, the centers of power, so they can be properly checked or can properly check each other, so that there can be a balance of power to limit the exercise of power. And of course, that means we need to break up all concentrations of power and thereby ensure that they will only operate within certain limited channels. That generalization is what I wish to point to tonight. There is an urgent need, society-wide need, for pluralism in every form. We need to break up not only political and military power, but also cultural and moral, that is to say as well, religious power. Now, how can one achieve political pluralism? Democratization is the single most powerful tool, as I said before, because democracy incorporates opposition parties, a government of checks and balances, an independent judiciary, as well as a free press and media, all of which can serve as counter forces or as checks to any attempt at a unified execution of genocide. Military pluralization is no less important. What that means is, of course, mainly the transfer of power to potential victims. Since 1945, it is no coincidence, starting with the Third World anti-colonial liberation movements, the growth of civil rights 
movements in the United States and throughout the world. The women's liberation movement, gay liberation, one could go on and on. What I think all these movements have in common is a legitimate and central goal, that those who are potential victims shall be empowered in some way. There shall be some transfer of power so that they have sufficient power to protect themselves and not have to depend even on the goodwill of others, even if that goodwill is in the hands of religious, political, or other distinguished leaders. The bottom line is that Franklin D. Roosevelt, one of the greatest liberal, most humane presidents of American history, failed to meet this test. That religious leadership did not exercise its own leadership at enough intensity or commitment to check the Nazis. You heard a magnificent portrait of the repeal of euthanasia under serious religious intervention. Unfortunately, the intensity of commitment to the Holocaust was greater, but the religious response was weaker. And one could go on and on to list the failures, world Jewry's failure to campaign and to bring pressure and say in America for adequate intervention. This, of course, explains this political military liberation, explains, of course, the rise of Zionism as well. Zionism represented the Jewish national liberation movement. But the truth is it did not gain the support of the majority of Jews until after the Holocaust. And many liberal Jews, particularly in this country, initially opposed it, saying, I have a, a country and I have democratic rights. Why do the Jews need their own particular country or their own guaranteed asylum? There were devout Jews who argued that one must wait for messianic or religious redemption. When the lessons of the Holocaust sank in, the state of Israel represented the transfer of political and military force to Jews, giving them the ability of self-defense and a place of guaranteed asylum, not depending on the goodwill of others. And of course, the truth is, were it not for Israel's existence, several additional Jewish communities would have been wiped out by now. Now, of course, to redistribute power brings with it two challenges which we have seen in these 50, 60 years. One is, in every, not in every case, that they succeed. And the power of dictatorship or other forms of oppression still is quite powerful. No less cogent a problem is that when the power was transformed and the new rulers exercised that power unchecked, and in some cases, just as oppressively and just as destructively as does those they replaced. So the challenge of pluralism is no less after distribution of power than it is before. Which brings me to the other major area, I believe, where the challenge of pluralizing is central. I speak now of moral and cultural pluralism. I remind you again, it was the absolute authority of this culture that lowered the resistance to the misuse of its best qualities. It was the absolute authority and desire to be accepted in this culture that weakened the Jewish ability to stand up and to press for help. When American Jews asked that the rail lines be bombed, when in general they asked for special intervention to stop the Holocaust, the tacit criticism was they're asking for special help. When this is a war to save humanity, in which the Jews should have no special request, they should be helped alongside others. But of course, the Jews were being killed specially. And by the time the war was won, most of the Jews were dead. The absolute authority of the past tradition, for example, the Christian teaching of contempt, weakened Christian resistance to speak out or to risk the very existence of the church under this kind of a circumstances. Thus, for example, important interventions were made to protect Jews who had converted to Christianity that were not matched by attempts to speak out for Jews who were remain Jewish and who were exposed to the full fury of the Nazi destructive process. In short, what I'm arguing is that unlimited power in any form is the enemy that has to be challenged here. I would include in this the Jewish rabbinic ethic of powerlessness and of dreaming of a 
messianic redemption, which opposed political action and Zionism, which weakened Jewish resistance to the ongoing process of the Holocaust. In short, the absence of countervailing philosophical and theological currents was just as damaging as the absence of physical and military means to check the Holocaust. The Nazi success, in fact, in promulgating their evil deeds was made even more possible by they had the ability to monopolize all the alternative sources and channels of values. For example, they take over the German Protestant church, including nominating pro-Nazi bishops while silencing the Catholic church. The Nazis conscripted all the media to this evil task, underwriting Nazi propaganda newspapers while silencing or eliminating uh, independent news and independent newspapers. The judiciary was purged and filled with Nazis. This removed not only legal review and judicial checks on this policy, but of course the judiciary itself sometimes is a source of potential alternatives of moral statement and moral values. Under Third Reich, this was not to be. The institutions of civil society, such as trade unions, chambers of commerce, social fellowship groups, also potential sources of counter values, were also taken over and not survived. The institutions of teachings were similarly co-opted to this cause. The universities were purged of Jews and of anti-Nazis. The hospitals and other teaching institutions, the professional associations were purged of Jews, then of anti-Nazis. In the end, these institutions either were on the sidelines or actively supported, and they failed to make the objections to the Nazis' policies that might have changed the outcome. Of course, everyone, not everyone understood the full extent of the mass murders. And although we should not forget at the same time how close places like Dachau and Bergen-Belsen were to actual settled cities, nor should one overlook how many thousands of soldiers participated in the shooting squads or concentration camps, or how many tens of thousands operated trains of deportation and destruction. So I acknowledge that not everybody agreed or willingly participated, but the vast majority were co-opted or turned into silence by the moral hegemony of the Nazis, which was not challenged or broken. Of course, the moral dominance of national socialism movement and its ability to get the SS and other soldiers to do the final dirty deeds, the actual liquidation, was reinforced by their absolutism of the military ethos of obedience to orders and by the SS ethos of absolute obedience to the Führer and to the group. There were no systematic efforts or alternative moral voices to speak out, to condemn or to organize them to check the slaughter. In places like Denmark, I would point again, where the Nazi rulers mixed with Danes and felt the sting of their moral condemnation, they actually weakened. Thus, the Nazi governors of Denmark were the ones who leaked the information of the coming deportation of the Jews, and they tacitly abetted the Danish rescue of the Jewish population. So cultural and moral pluralism is needed to match political, military, economic, and social force. And here a word on the very essence of the definition of pluralism. I mean by that a principled commitment that is carried out with methodological modesty, if you will, epistemological modesty, in which positions, be they religious, moral codes, scientific, which indeed believe that they are principled and are carrying a truth message, nevertheless carry them with modesty, acknowledging the importance of limits and of alternatives so that their claims their teaching, their processes, undergo the review and the check of alternative positions. It's a paradox here. I want to acknowledge the danger of what I'm saying. Franklin Littell has argued that the 
weakening of a sense of absolute moral code, that the, in the modern insistence on diversity and awareness of the limits of one's position, in the training I pointed to, to objective research and objective teaching independent of moral ends, weakened the ability of people to stand up to Nazism, because it took, after all, a willingness to make an absolute stand, to put one's life on the line in many cases. And therefore, Littell has argued that part of the issue is the relativism and the growth of relativism. And I acknowledge and affirm that too. When relativism spreads, then people weaken their ability to make judgments and to pass judgments even on genocide. And when relativism spreads, people hesitate, why should I risk my life when nothing that serious is at stake? But here is my point. Absolutism is dangerous, and even good values when they are absolutized and go out of control become a threat. But relativism is equally another form of absolutism that undermines, and, and in a way, when it is universalized, challenges the other. I'm OK, you're OK, that we can pass judgment, not even on SS. I am arguing, therefore, for a third alternative position, and that is pluralism. The pluralist believes that there are genuine principles, that truth and morality are real and are absolutely valid, and they must be upheld, and I have an obligation to uphold them, absolutely, and stand up for them, even to martyrdom if that is morally necessary and if the issue is urgent enough. But I accept the limits of my truth, my faith, my discipline, my science. I also recognize the need for limits, and I welcome them. It may be that I have a truth, but it's only partially true. It may be completely true, but there are other truths out there, some of which may even contradict mine. It may, in fact, be true, but it may not cover all people, all groups, all situations, all times. And even if I am completely right, if this very right principle is extended indefinitely, it will go too far and eventually metastasize and turn into a form of abuse. So I welcome, I even work for alternative channels, alternative forces, alternative critiques. I welcome the clash of values and the balance of power between multiple religions, and even between religion and secularity. It's that modesty that I think becomes critical to create a framework in which you can have cooperation, in which religion and science, for example, can begin to cooperate to prevent a repetition. Today, there are two great forces which shape the moral consensus of contemporary society and of what is a legitimate social policy, science and religion. We need on both hands an acknowledgement of the need for pluralism to balance and put limits on each other. Science needs to be checked with moral judgments and recognizing some of its own limitations. Religion needs to be checked so as not in the name of its absolutes to justify violence or to override moral alternatives and not to be a source of demonizing of others who may disagree. Pluralism, therefore, involves accepting these limits and assuming the essential value of balances and alternatives, even on the part of good political systems and healthy, valid religions. In the pluralistic perspective, even if I have absolute authority and absolute relation, I allow for the position of the others with contradictory views, which may in part grow out of recognition of the existence of multiple truths or the frailty and limit of my own human judgment and my own self-interest, which may distort or even corrupt my own judgment. So I accept the fact that no one group can have absolute authority, and in light of their dignity, the other has the right to be heard, even where I think they're wrong. Therefore, we need dialogue. Therefore, we need an ongoing cultural conversation, and that all these factors play a major role in setting up limits and justifying their control of any particular position of power. Science and religion will need to work together to develop such a cultural pluralism. 
there should not be one uniform source of moral consensus. And I would apply this to a range, to the unmet and opening challenges of bioethics and of human cloning, or even to a more conventional everyday challenge, the struggle in America to recognize and to uphold the diversity of education, educational approaches. I would argue that if more students go to public school, it is good that there are private and parochial schools to offer ethical and cultural balance. In public policy, where there are cultural war issues, it is important that we have not been able to foreclose one or the other side. Let me give an example again in terms of abortion. My own personal background as an Orthodox Jew is that abortion is generally not acceptable and is to be, it is permitted only in very restricted cases and the restricted cases are when the mother's life is at stake and some other very limited cases. Nevertheless, I would argue that it is good that we have an important and ongoing national conflict, even though it's very frustrating to all the parties that their particular viewpoint has not been acceptable. Where there is support for abortion, there has been a greater legal protection for the mother's life. And there has been a greater ability to uphold the issue of quality of life, although that is a slippery slope if not handled well. If there is a total uh, ban on abortion, as we have seen it in countries in South America and other places, there has been an accommodant rise of achieving sometimes ritual or theological uh, sanctity or purity, giving priority over the lives of mothers, including people who resorted to illegal or non-legal forms of abortion at great personal health or life cost. It is also good, however, and no less urgent morally, that there is opposition to abortion. And I think the antagonism and the treating of the Catholic bishops in this country as if they are somehow improper for insisting and for arguing the urgency of the issue. Because it, when abortion becomes routine, and in countries where it has become routine, such as in the former Soviet Union, there are higher rates of abortion, and this has led to a cheapening of life, even to the use of abortion as a form of contraception ahead of other forms of contraception. In short, in society where religion is too dominant, science and scientific development tend to be set back and restricted unjustly. We see now the, the crisis in Islamic countries where excessive religious dominance has led to tests of science, scientists, religious um, personal behaviors, glorification of tradition and repression of science, which is seen as challenging tradition, such as an evolution. Whereas in societies where science is too dominant, such as in secular societies under Marxism, religion and other forms of cultural artistic development as well are retarded and repressed. In the former Soviet Union, religion itself was restricted, but under this cover, religion was persecuted and civil society itself was crippled, thereby paralyzing and dominating the moral discourse. Pluralism, therefore, in the end, must be built on a balance of power, a balance of power that is dynamic. Then it can, in an ongoing way, protect freedom, dignity, and inquiry. And therefore, I believe it brings the promise of preventing the concentration of power, be it political, military, economic, cultural, or religious. Today, the sheer volume and the overwhelming amounts of power available make it of the highest urgency to build in these checks and balances. We see, for example, for our very eyes, that industry, technology, and the profit motive among the glories and the greatest achievements of American society going out of control begin to threaten the viability of the planet. To this task of establishing the right balance of upholding the authority and the passion of our moral commitments and the sanctity of life, and at the same time learning the restraint and the self-control to recognize the contradictory and the positive role of the other, 
That is not an easy task either for religion or for science, but I believe together we have the chance to create an environment which prevents not only a potential Holocaust, but perhaps prevents the lesser forms of abuse that are equally destructive of the moral and civic fiber of society.